Okay, let's see if my clicker works. It does, hooray. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. I'm Kate, and I'm a developer at The Guardian. My pronouns are she, her, and feel free to message me or The Guardian developers on Twitter. I'm here to talk to you all about AWS security because I thought that a talk based on documentation had a slightly higher chance than getting accepted than one on GDPR compliance. <laughs> However, now that I've got a microphone, a stage, and all of you lovely folks as a captive audience, who knows what will happen. Either way, um, I'm going to share how we improve the security and monitoring of our AWS accounts in the hope that I can help you improve the security and monitoring of your own AWS accounts. Even if you're not using AWS, some of the learnings will still be really helpful if you're building internal tools for your colleagues. So when I say The Guardian, I mean Guardian Digital. Hopefully you know and love some of our work. We're 160 people, approximately 80 of us being software developers, spread across 14 cross-functional teams. We are also hiring, so come chat to us later. Most of our infrastructure is in the cloud, and it's split across 44 different AWS accounts, which are owned and managed by our various teams. We're also blessed to have a fantastic InfoSec team of our own. However, working at The Guardian gives these folks a rather large and unusual remit. So they might be kind of busy at times. Besides, if you're lucky enough to have a dedicated security team, you shouldn't be making them the sole people responsible for all of your data security. You should be learning from them and collaborating with them. Because if we're giving developers ownership of building and deploying our infrastructure, we should be giving them ownership of securing it. And this is really, really important. So we can do this by sharing security expertise and responsibility the same ways that we share operations expertise and responsibility. And for those of us in the cloud, this is really important because the cloud is just someone else's computer, but it's one that you can't pull the ethernet cable out of. And AWS make it painfully clear that security and compliance is a shared responsibility between them and us. With the customer being responsible for security in the cloud, which covers rather a lot of things. And if you get it wrong, AWS feels that it's entirely your fault. So we need to take care of all of those things that AWS doesn't. AWS haven't abandoned us completely, however. There is a multitude of products and price tiers that you can use to help you cover some of your obligations. I want to talk about a couple of them. First, Trusted Advisor. If it isn't already, this should be your new best friend. And the good news is that the best things in life are indeed free. You can find it in your AWS console, and it has a whole load of assessments and recommendations. Diving into just the security section of those should give most account admins more than enough to horrify or to occupy them. <laughs> okay, starting, first of all, with S3 bucket permissions, the security issue that just won't die. Um, there's a few different websites you can go to to have a crawl around of open public buckets and see what's in them. Searching for secrets on this one is always a fun start. Okay. So why are so many of us getting it wrong? Well, writing good cloud formation can be esoteric and hard, and bucket policies are a hard thing to sometimes get right. So you can already check your bucket permissions in the S3 console. Amazon have even added this bright yellow roundel to help us realize that we have public buckets. But you don't check the S3 console after every policy change or CloudFormation update. So many of us are still getting caught out. For example, here's a policy that I found in a recent AWS help forum. The state intention was to allow read and write access 
for all IM users of the account. Can anyone figure out what might be wrong with it? So, principal AWS star is equivalent to principal star. And using this wildcard will grant permission to everyone, which is also referred to as anonymous access. So, AWS says that using it should be done with caution. Thankfully for S3 Buckman missions, an explicit, denial, uh, an explicit deny overrules and allow. So, even if you have this in your templates, you might be safe, but watch out for it anyway. Okay, so this brings me on to security groups. These are your virtual firewalls, and another area that Trusted Advisor will show you. You can use them to control the traffic to one or more of your instances, and you can configure both the ingress or the egress rules to lock down ports to specific IP ranges. Ingress rules are a good place to focus your efforts. However, the default for egress is wide open, which may not be desirable. AWS cautions us that unrestricted access can lead to malicious activity. And Trusted Advisor will help us apply the principle of least privilege, that a system should only be able to access the information and resources that it actually needs. So Trusted Advisor will flag open or overly permissive security groups and help you apply that principle of least privilege. Now, Trusted Advisor will also flag security groups if they're inside a virtual private cloud, which might be a private area of AWS you're paying for, which initially may be annoying to you because if a security group is wide open but your VPC is not, does it really matter? Well, here's a chance to apply some defense in depth. Besides, are you sure that security group is in a VPC? If so, how is that VPC configured? This is not always straightforward to check, particularly via the AWS console. So combine your security groups and VPCs. And remember that if there's more than one rule for a specific port, the most permissive one will be the one that's applied, which seems completely crazy, but oh well. Um, so if you think that Trusted Advisor is flagging kind of like things as false positives, it may not be. You might have restricted them, but if there's still a permissive rule there, it's still going to win. Okay. So that's about it for Trusted Advisor. It's awesome. Definitely use it if you're not. I'm going to talk about AWS Inspector next. So this is a tool that's intended for on-server protection and automated security assessments. And we've been using it, and it's helped us fix an awful lot of our security issues across our entire fleet of instances. Okay. So again, check it out on the dashboard. Um, it is quite useful, but unfortunately, it's not free. The current cost is approximately 30 cents per instance per scan, which can be relatively high, particularly on a scaled out service such as theguardian.com. So one thing that we did do was we only ran it on specific instances, and we did this using tagging. Um, and that can just target to perhaps just your production servers. Okay. So it will cover things like security best practices, um, flagging uh, when users are allowed to log in with root credentials over SSH, or when a network has a service enabled that it's not using. Again, helping you apply that principle of least privilege. It also includes runtime behavior analysis, which can be really interesting, but is sometimes not quite granular enough to be helpful. For example, 
It will tell you there's unencrypted traffic on port 80, which might be a cause for concern, particularly if you're not expecting any traffic on port 80. After receiving this rather cryptic <coughs> message, um, <laughs> one of our team members spent quite a bit of time investigating because we really wanted to get down to zero issues, and it was a point of pride by that point. And our instance shouldn't have been talking on port 80 at all. So it actually turned out that the remote host was AWS, and it was talking to the EC2 instance metadata service. Um, this renders the check effectively useless and the AWS Inspector report a little bit noisy. To be fair, AWS Inspector is relatively new and they're still working on it, so who knows what the future holds, but just watch out for this one if it catches you as well. Okay, so this brings me to AWS Stack Sets. This is not a security tool directly, but it's certainly one that you can use to help you improve the security of your AWS accounts. Stack sets are part of AWS CloudFormation, CloudFormation being a service that will help you construct and configure an entire stack across AWS using templates. This enables you to quickly replicate your infrastructure and also controls and tracks changes to your infrastructure. Stack sets are a way of supercharging cloud formation. They will allow you to create, update, or delete stacks across multiple accounts, all with a single kind of like console action, which is incredibly powerful and incredibly useful. For example, maybe you want to enable CloudTrail in all accounts. You can do this with stack sets a lot quicker. While the initial setup is quite manual, if you think you're going to use more than one stack set, it's definitely worth doing. You'll need to select one of your accounts to become the stack set admin, and then give it a stack set administrator role. The other accounts will all require a stack set target role. Rather wonderfully, the stack set admin can also be its own stack set target. So it can also administer itself. OK, so once you've done that, you've set up what AWS terms a trusted relationship. And now you've given the StackSet admin power to carry out CloudFormation actions in all of those accounts. And you can quite happily take one action and create a stack when you need it. Okay. So it's powerful, it's useful, great, but there are some downsides to this. You've now just created an overpowered stack set admin. I've already mentioned the principle of least privilege, but now you have the one account that can go and do everything in every other account. So choose your stack set admin wisely. You might want to make a dedicated account for stack setting, or at least have that account kind of like really locked down so you know who's accessing it and why. You're also going to encounter new forms of cloud drift where things deviate from what you'd initially created. Because nothing prevents a stack that is part of a stack set from being modified or deleted from within any of the accounts. We also found issues with communicating changes. I mentioned that our teams all own and maintain their own AWS accounts. Well, if you're stack setting, you're going to start creating roles and resources across other people's accounts. So tagging them becomes really important. And also, those stacks won't have a useful name because AWS just gives it a random string. So use a description of the tags to communicate to teams what's suddenly appearing in their accounts. Spoilers. OK. So that's just about it for the AWS tools and products that I recommend. Um, come chat to me later if you want to hear some more. I'm going to talk a bit about Def by Dashboards. Because if you're just adopting Trusted Advisor and AWS Inspector, that's already two new dashboards, multiplied out by however many AWS accounts that you have. That can leave you with rather a lot of dashboards, 
which will probably delight whoever has to go and check all of those, whether it be your InfoSec team or someone else. So if you already have too many dashboards, why on earth would you build one more? Well, because good feedback is specific, timely, and actionable. And for a problem to be fixed, it needs to be visible. So if you're going to use those tools from AWS, you need to get them in front of people. So build the one dashboard that can rule and replace them all. We did. We called it Security HQ. Um, and this is how we made it. Okay. This is my most complicated slide, so I'm going to break it down. Sorry. Okay. So first of all, we used stack sets to create a role in each of the accounts the Security HQ can assume. The role has the required permissions for the services, Trusted Advisor and AWS Inspector, that we want Security HQ to be able to make API calls to. Security HQ can therefore fetch and store not only the reports for its own account, but the reports for all of our accounts. If you want to ever expand permissions so we can integrate more services or add more data to Security HQ, we can use the stack set to update all of our roles at once with a single CloudFormation change. So now that we have a central dashboard, teams no longer need to do the legwork themselves. And InfoSec can quickly get an overview of all of the accounts. But we can do better than that. There's an important distinction between using an AWS product and making it useful. The various dashboards of AWS have issues with both discoverability and usability. So build the dashboard that you deserve. Make it specific. Add the details that you care about. AWS does have fantastic and rather powerful APIs, so lean on them beyond just fetching the basic reports. We started enriching the basic reports and supplementing them with the data that was important to us. I mentioned earlier that it's not always easy to see if a security group flagged by Trusted Advisor is inside of EPC. So making another API call allows us to add the VPC details to the security groups, so they become easy to check. Combining and chaining API calls can provide information that's not available anywhere on the AWS documentation, yet is incredibly useful. For example, we found out which security groups were in use and added resource details to them. Why is this useful? Because we decided that security groups that were not in use and had no resources associated with them should be a lower priority. So people could focus on fixing the bigger security issues first. You want to draw attention to the things that you care about and remove and hide the things that you don't. You can apply your own custom alerting levels depending on what your priorities are. Those security issues that whilst are still issues are minor and probably not going to be fixed or prioritized anytime soon, you may want to demote or even hide. If something's a false positive, like the inspector port 80 issue, won't fix or accepted risk, let the central dashboard be responsible for filtering that out, rather than expecting your users to do so, either in AWS or mentally every time they have to go to your dashboard. Because if you're flagging something to a user, it should be actionable. If you're building internal tooling, you're incredibly lucky because your users are typically in the same building and they can't run away from you. So go and talk to them. Get feedback from both junior and senior team members. Your AWS power users already have some solutions to the problems or data that they need. So find out what they're doing and build it into your tool. Your junior team members will help you not assume knowledge. And these are the people that your tool should be supporting and helping. The people who feel less confident with AWS are the people you want to make more confident. 
You need to consider how your tool can teach best practices and recommend corrective actions without sending someone to a lengthy AWS documentation page. So think about summarizing some of the key points from them. Because anyone seeing the issue should feel empowered and confident to fix the issue, or at least raise it with the team that can tackle it themselves. Because best efforts are better than no efforts. So within our dashboard, we did add short recommendations based on what we now know. We linked our dashboard directly to the AWS console section where users can go to fix an issue. You might want to consider using pop-ups or modals to help give context. And take the opportunity to get feedback before you explain anything. Ask your coworkers to try out the tool and silently take notes while they explore it. Because you might find that your intuitive navigation is not so intuitive. Or something you had assumed was common knowledge is not so common. Build a tool that they actually need, not the one that you think they need. And remember that your creative vision matters less than experience of the people using your tools. And that nobody reads the documentation. Okay. So, even if you have sat down with teams, incorporated their suggestions, taken action on their feedback, completed those feature requests, and fixed those pesky UX or design issues, a good dashboard is still a dashboard, doomed to obscurity without intervention. Maybe checking it will become a monthly or a bi-weekly task, but a lot can happen in 14 days. And compliance is not security. For good security, you need minimal exposure, ideally fixing things as soon as they occur. You can do this with real-time alerting. So give your dashboard a way to summon users. We built a notification service with AWS Lambda that our central dashboard can use to alert teams to issues. As with any notification system, it's important to remove noise so you do not overwhelm your users or cause alarm fatigue. So it's just as well that we've already made our dashboard specific and expanded the alert levels to give us a bit more granular control over when we want to alert and where maybe this is just something that a user should know. Because when everything is urgent, nothing is. So if Trusted Advisor starts off by finding hundreds of issues in each account, don't worry, you're not alone. But maybe a good first step is not alerting on the existing issues, but just on any new ones. The final benefit of a central dashboard is that you're going to make your security status visible and transparent. All teams can access Security HQ, not just our InfoSec team and they'll see exactly what InfoSec sees. This is good because it's a shared responsibility model that we should all strive for is this. Leave it better than you found it because we succeed and fail together. Any team should be able to raise security issues or try and fix them themselves, not just a dedicated security one. Now, despite all of this, if you're going to centralize your AWS reporting to give an overview of all of your accounts, you absolutely should listen by the order and severity of the issues descending. So brightly colored warning counts are a huge bonus to your new leaderboard of insecurity. And now hopefully everyone has a little bit of extra motivation to fix things. And of course, you can see where security efforts are needed most. So, Security HQ is a solution that worked for us, but find a solution that worked for you. All of the data security tools are open source and available on GitHub, but there's a lot of other really good ones out there, such as Scout2, CloudFront, or CNFNAG. And take inspiration from those other projects. 
If you're overwhelmed or excited or just in need of the coffee break, here are some key takeaways. However, do drop me a message or come find me in the open spaces. Thank you.